Thank you. Good morning. Um, so I come from a long line of, there we go, alcoholics. I come from a long line of alcoholics. I just demonstrated that. Um, <laughs> And, and my dad broke that cycle of alcoholism. He was sober for 47 years before he died. I grew up going to AA meetings. And then as an adult, I matured in Al-Anon. And in AA and Al-Anon, we love our cliches. And this is one of the ones that I learned at a very young age, and I am saying today, take what you like, leave the rest. I'm not an expert. I have my own ideas on, on what leadership is all about. I'm happy to share them and have a great conversation with you. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and that's okay, and you figure out what you want. What I want to do today is talk briefly about just where I came from, my career path, although John pretty much hit those slides, so thank you, John, um, and, and then talk a little bit about what I mean by disruption and some ideas on, on leadership and what it means. So what you need to know about me, um, I was on the six-year undergraduate plan. I am intimately acquainted with higher education. I've spent a significant part of my life at universities. Um, and I did this because I was a chemistry major till that scholarship was done, and then I became a French major until I realized I couldn't keep up with the kids who had been to France. So then I became a French education teacher, because if you can't do it, you teach it, right? And I spent a semester in a high school and said, I will never do this. And so then I became an English major, because I'd been taking English classes all along, because that was what I really loved and should have been doing all along. I also got married, had a kid, did some other things. It took me a little while to get through undergrad. The last class I needed to graduate was college algebra. I think this is the only class I did every assigned homework problem for. I know it's the only class I did every unassigned homework problem for. So John, if you wonder why discount rate is hard for me to figure out, okay, I am not a mathematician. Grad school, 12 years start to finish, because I did two years straight through. Family, I had two kids by that point in time. I needed to go make money. I left, I went to work, but I kept driving by that university every day, going, oh, I gotta get back, I gotta get back, I gotta get back. And I did. By the time I went back, they didn't write master's theses anymore, but I had to write a master's thesis, because when I was there, only the wimps did the comprehensive exam, and if I was gonna do that, I'd have to start over, and I wasn't gonna start over, so I negotiated. I really would encourage anyone to do this. Number one, you get to come up with just brilliant titles of theses, and I do love mine, um, but the opportunity to work on a research piece at length over time and really invest yourself in it is a critically important thing. And, and I learned so much that I bring into the world of work from that process that, that I will be forever grateful that I was able to do that. So what you need to know about me, Denise and I had three children in 39 months. Um, so three kids in diapers at the same time translated to three kids in college at the same time. And they let me do strategic planning. Can you believe that? Okay. <laughs> Seriously. Um, but it does, again, help me. My experiences as a parent let me talk to parents in a very real way about what they're going through as they think about the college experience and this transition to college and to talk about affordability and be able to say, I was glad when grandma said she'd write a check to help pay for college so that parents don't feel embarrassed or ashamed if they're not prepared. And most parents, regardless of how much money they make, are not really prepared when they face the college experience. My hobby, I do write. I get up at 3.45 a.m. The important thing here is I think whatever you do, you need opportunity in your life to not do it. And so for me, this is almost a form of meditation. I cannot think about any of the stuff that weighs on my mind at work and be in a place of concentration where I can pick up something that maybe I've been working on for five, six, seven, eight years and get back to where I was yesterday to carry that forward. So it, it really is, it's a great every morning, 
I am spending an hour or two hours immersed in a world that has nothing to do with the world in which I'm going to go into so that I come in here refreshed, ready to go, and do the things that I need to do. Um, my career path. So I was a janitor for six years. Those were my undergrad years at Ohio State. I will tell you that I learned many important things, not only how to strip wax and buff a tile floor, which I do know how to do and do it very well, I learned an awful lot about how you interact with people, with the public who have a contract with somebody in an office, but I'm the person delivering the product and what was sold isn't going to work and we have to negotiate it out. I learned what it's like to deal with drunks at 3 o'clock in the morning when the dance is over and they don't want to leave and what it's like at 6 o'clock in the morning when you were at the bar with your roommate and they're calling in sick and you're their supervisor and you know why they're sick. I learned a lot from that experience and it has informed much of what I do. I was a graduate teaching assistant for two years. I learned an incredible amount not so much about teaching, because they didn't teach us that, but about personalities and how students react, how we all react when we think we know something, when we're afraid we don't know something, how people avoid, how people will address things head on, and just understanding how group dynamics work. When you're sitting in front of a room of 25 students and nobody's willing to talk because they haven't read the assignment, you learn what it means to be able to do those things. I did spend um, seven years, or I'm sorry, two years doing telemarketing, selling magazines over the telephone. And I became a master at getting your credit card number. Um, I was very good at that. Uh, two experiences that stand out, though. Black Monday. So Black Monday was the biggest stock market crash up until 1987. And so what was interesting, because we worked a morning shift 9 to 1, didn't impact that at all. We worked an evening shift five to nine. So by five o'clock, stock market's closed. Everybody knows this terrible thing has happened. People bought those magazines like nuts that night. Yeah, absolutely the wrong response. The response to this big emotional, is this the next collapse? Are we going to go into a big depression was, I can afford $30 a month, I'm gonna buy this thing, I'm gonna, and we sold lights out that whole week because people just had an emotional need to respond to that and buying something that wasn't super expensive was the way they did it. That was very, very eye-opening for me. Black Thursday, nobody's heard about but me, Black Thursday, September 15th, 1988, is the day my youngest daughter was born. It's the day I got fired for trying to take two weeks of vacation to be home with my new child because there was no paternity leave in 1988 and my boss thought one afternoon off was enough. Didn't matter that I had the time accrued, didn't matter. They were not gonna let me take time off. And so you stick that in your brain and you think about what work is and what it means. Uh, then I spent seven years working for a design remodel company. I went there, I'd been at a telemarketing company, I went to do telemarketing. The woman who hired me, I'd worked for before, she hired me because she was gonna quit. I didn't know that. Her boss didn't know that, she knew that because she knew I'd be able to step in and do her job. So within two weeks, I was in her job, but I stayed there seven years and learned a new industry and learned, again, a lot of skills. Best company I've ever worked in terms of meetings. We met for 15 minutes a day, 7 a.m. to 7.15. If you needed more than that to describe what your issue was, sorry, Charlie, it wasn't going to happen. And then everybody went out and worked. And we talked a lot on the phone and all of this stuff, but we worked. I also learned how to make decisions in this role. So when I became the construction manager, uh, other than ruining an incredible number of suits, climbing on people's roofs and stuff, I would get calls from our construction teams. Jefferson, I got a problem. What is it? Well, I tore down that, that wall. I tore it open to tear out the wall for the kitchen expansion. Okay, what's the problem? There's a water and electric line right in that wall. Great, Ralph. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. What should I do? Well, Ralph, if you were doing this at your home, what would you do? Well, I'd cap the water line off below the foundation and I'd rewire the electric. Ralph, that's exactly what we were going to do. So you go ahead and do that. 
I didn't, wasn't there. All I had was a plan to look at. Ralph was an expert. Ralph couldn't make a decision. Ralph was afraid to take responsibility in case it was the wrong decision, even though he had all of the technical skill in the world. And what I learned from that experience is that leadership is not about technical ability. It has nothing to do with your ability. In fact, if you look at this job progression, every single job till I came to Otterbein, I changed industries when I changed jobs. And I went into industries I had no experience in. But I took a skill set that wasn't dependent on the industry in which I was going to work. When I went to Ohio State University, and I was there for quite a while, I learned enrollment management. And at that time, we were calling it strategic enrollment management. And that really is focused on how do your inputs get to certain outputs. So it's still very much about recruitment and who you recruit and how you market to bring in a group of students that will give you a certain kind of outcome. What I really learned, though, at Ohio State was, as in many of my jobs, very accidental. We were successful developing an enrollment management model because we had two parallel processes that were not connected but had the same leader. So we had one associate provost who was responsible for supervising the undergraduate admissions team, and she also supervised the undergraduate education advisors. So while we were investing all this money in recruitment and marketing and doing all these really sexy kinds of things, she had the committee on the undergraduate experience that was looking at um, oversubscribed classes, gateway classes, how to improve student experience. The kids we were bringing in fed into the work that she was doing, and that's what drove Ohio State's rise from bottom of the Big Ten to near the top, from open enrollment to highly selective. We didn't do it on purpose. It was purely accidental that those two things were happening in parallel. But that's what enrollment, really, enrollment management really is about. So when I came to Otterbein, I like to talk about integrated enrollment management which is managing everything that touches the student life cycle from the moment you start to think about them as a recruit until they graduate. Some people think of that as empire building. I have been accused of that. But I don't need to own it. I just need to be engaged in the conversation with people so that we have a thoughtful, integrated approach from the day we first see that student before they get here until the day they graduate. And that drives success for the institution and the student. So it's a continuing evolution of uh, this work. Um, so let's talk for a minute about disruption. So Christensen wrote about innovative disruption and or disruption innovation, which is when you bring technology to a industry and it totally changes it. The great example is Netflix. Um, it took Netflix more than a decade to actually make that change, but they impacted both cable TV and people like Blockbuster with a technological innovation. There is a ton of technological innovation happening in higher education. There isn't yet significant proof that it is anywhere near as disruptive as people thought it would be when it was rolled out. And it might be too early to know. Um, the other disruption is disturbance or problems which interrupt an event, activity, or process. And we live in a world of that. And when you put both of those things together, you get to the kind of disruption that I'm talking about when we think about leadership in a, in a time of, of disruption. So welcome to my nightmare. The Great Recession, okay, it's been more than a decade. It is still impacting higher education. Even as we are now starting to talk about the next recession, we have not recovered from the first recession. What's interesting is that, that the impact of the Great Recession was not immediate on higher education, um, especially privates. It actually was felt more quickly in public universities because of the impact on state budgets and the funding models for public universities. Many private schools, Otterbein was no exception to that, continued to grow enrollment. Otterbein's highest enrollment year was 2010, two years after the Great Recession. 
And Otterbein, like many other universities, thought, we are the geniuses who figured this out, and this isn't going to impact us. We hadn't changed business process. We hadn't become more efficient. We hadn't become more affordable. In fact, in 2010, we were raising tuition by 5%, 6% at a time on big dollar amounts. We just thought we were special. And lots of other private universities felt the very same thing. So for us, the bottom dropped out in 2012. Other schools carried it a few more years, but almost all of them have felt the impact of this, and we are still working through it because it changed consumer behavior in ways that other recessions didn't. And in fact, in ways, for those of you who have parents or grandparents who were alive during the Depression, it, it's that kind of lasting change where people who grew up in that environment kept those behaviors they learned for the rest of their lives. So here are uh, just a bunch of the different things, MOOCs, those massive online classes that, that people thought, oh, it's gonna destroy higher education. Well, no, it hasn't really, but somebody might figure out a way to turn it into a revenue driver at some point in time. The idea of crushing student debt, and, and again, the media fascination with debt as an issue without actually understanding who's impacted by it and what the real implications are. Things like the Varsity blue scandal, or even worse for me, is these wealthy families in Illinois who are turning guardianship of their kids over to other people so they'll be independent and therefore Pell Grant eligible. Those people should go to jail. Republicans think colleges and universities negatively impact. I mean, there is a lot in our um, sphere of, of influence that just touches the work that we do again and again and again. And we've lost some things that were really important, that, that education is a public good, that we all benefit from having an educated society, and we've gone even beyond it's a, it's a private good. To, it's actually negative for other people when you go out and get your, your kid educated. Things like textbook prices. Um, in Ohio, um, the public university graduation rate is about 36%, but if you throw out Ohio State and Miami, it drops to 28%. Four years, just over a quarter of the kids that go to any other Ohio public university, 28%. I mean, there are problems in, in the way some of this happens and, and how we deal with it. So 187 approved institutions of higher education in the state of Ohio. Too much higher education in the state of Ohio. I would be fine if several of them closed, as long as it's not the one I'm working for. Um, we have uh, over five universities that will have an entering first year class of 100 to 120. We have uh, probably 15 that are under 250 or thereabouts. I mean, very small schools that struggle then to provide the resources and opportunities. And, and if these students were distributed across slightly fewer schools, it would probably be better for everybody. Uh, you'll remember Jim Rhodes wanted a university within 30 minutes of every Ohio, and well, he got his wish, because this really isn't even counting any online institution or anything like that. So there's just a ton of higher education in our marketplace. So this is a graph of the number of high school graduates in the Midwest from 2001 to 2034. And um, so if you, high point in the past, okay, that's number one, low point 2031, about the year I get to retire, um, we are in a blight of students. And this is cyclical. It happens. It's been happening and happened in the 80s, happened in the 90s. We will go through this again and again and again. But significant drop. This is actually one of the outcomes of the Great Recession because families young families chose to have fewer children because they saw what happened to their parents and they didn't want to be in that situation themselves. So this is a problem. This is the Midwest. When you look at the United States, 
So blue is declining, white currently is no growth or, or loss, and then growth. So you, you look at where, um, so Ohio and states like it are anywhere from 7 to 10% decline in high school graduates from now until 2032. Where you have growth, South Dakota, or I'm sorry, that's North Dakota. There are no people in North Dakota, okay? And, and if fracking ends, that probably ends, okay? So great percentage growth on a really small population doesn't mean, mean growth. And even big states that were for years drivers. So the other challenge that you don't see in this map is that the most reliable college-going population is white families. And they are declining at precipitous rates, even greater than the graph and being replaced with more first-generation immigrant new American families, which is not bad for America, but it's bad for an industry that has relied on middle-class white kids to make up the bulk of our, our populations. So this creates just real um, challenge, and you really begin to understand that it's not just an individual state or even a region. This is a national problem in terms of higher education. An economist, uh, Nathan Graw, wrote a book called uh, Demographics and the Demand for Higher Education, and he takes this data and he cuts it even deeper and says the 50 most competitive schools actually will have higher market demand over this time period. Now, it doesn't matter because those schools don't want to grow. So more families will want to go there, but they won't be able to. The next 50, which generally are your state flagships, in terms of just population will have lower demand, but they'll get that spillover from the, the top 50, so they'll probably be okay. But regional schools like us are in a market that is contracting and contracting quickly and seriously, and so this is, this is disruption. So this is kind of the world in which I want to talk now a little bit about leadership. The, the first thing I want to go back to the point I made about my changing industries so much. My view of leadership is it is not about technological skill. It is not about strategy or tactics or your ability to do marketing. Leadership is about how you interact with people, whether one-on-one, -on -one, in large groups, in small groups. And, and that's really what I want to talk about today is, is what it means to be a leader in terms of interacting with people. So the first thing that I think is critical is you have to know who you are. If you don't understand strengths and weaknesses and the things that get in the way of your own performance and how you show up, you are never going to be a good leader. So on mine, I put some things that I would call strengths and some things that I would call weaknesses. I am a storyteller. I think that is my greatest strength. I'm not a data analyst, but what I can do is take that data and tell people the narrative of it and why it's important and make it matter. That is what I do, and that is really all that I do. Contacts and connectedness, that's from StrengthsQuest. The reason I put them there is because, number one, every time I've done StrengthsQuest, those two have shown up as my highest two in that order. Uh, and number two, because they tie right back into, that's what that storytelling is all about, okay? What is the context in which this data lives? How is it connected to everything else? So I am damn confident, I have been told. I put that on both sides because I've also been told, you're so damn confident, I'm afraid to raise my hand and disagree with you. My own team is here, will tell. I'm begging people, disagree with me, please, but sometimes they don't. So I have to be really, really cautious about that. Am I presenting my point of view so strongly that people assume I'm not going to listen to them? or I just convince them I'm right before they even get a chance to, to figure it out. Uh, I am very risk tolerant. Uh, some people would also put that in the weakness column, but we're only here once, okay? If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, okay? As you've seen, I can go do something else, okay? So that's never been my worry. I do believe my faith is really important. I think I'm highly structured. Denise would say that I am rigid and unflexible. I think other people who've seen my office would say, no, you're not structured at all. You have crap everywhere, and, and how do you work? But my mind works in a certain way. 
My mind is highly structured. And I have to understand that because that impacts the way I interact with the world. And that can be good for me and it can be bad for me and, and the way that I come to opportunities. I am an introvert. I do a lot of public speaking. That has nothing to do with being an introvert. Being an introvert is if we were all standing around with a cup of coffee, I would be over here in the corner by myself because I'm not comfortable in that kind of one-on-one. -on -one. And I need that two hours at four o'clock in the morning in the dark by myself to energize myself for the day. I need to understand that. Um, I am hyper-rational, uh, which is good for me, I think, but it really bothers people who are emotional <laughs> because sometimes I don't pick up on emotional cues. I need to always remember that. Uh, controller, yeah, I'm a boss person, I get it. I am very deadline-driven, which again, lets me get stuff done, but it also means sometimes I put stuff off until I have to get it done, and that makes it, but just understanding who I am. Leaders cast a shadow. How you show up impacts everybody in your organization, and if you don't understand how you're showing up, you don't understand the impact that you are having on the people that work for you, and one unstated lessons they are taking from you, and that's gonna show up in the way they work. So I want to understand who I am so I can be better equipped at knowing what are people walking away from. Know your myths. What are your stories? Your personal stories, your business stories. Otterbein has these lovely historical stories. They're incredible. They're also easy to get so romantically engaged in that you feel like we already did the work that we're here to do and to let it ride. And that's never good enough. So you really have to understand, and by myths, I don't mean made up stories. They can be very, very real, but we live in this world of, of mythologies. Who are you? Who is the organization you work for? Why is that important? Does your team understand that? Do the people that you're working with, the consumers you're working with, what does your myth mean to them? Do they have expectations that you can't live up to because you keep telling stories that may not be relevant to who you are today or the work that you're doing. Opportunity most often comes disguised as challenge. I have never had somebody send out, God, oh, I got a great opportunity for you that didn't involve pain. I mean, it just always involves some kind of challenge. And, and most frequently, it's, it's in its face something bad the first time you react to it. And so understanding that reaction when somebody on your team leaves, when your boss leaves, is that good or bad? It's neither, it just is. But your reaction to that is really, really important. And that can be great opportunity if you let it be a great opportunity. So being open to what are the um, hidden blessings in this thing that I am dealing with can get you to a better, more meaningful outcome very, very quickly. It's easy to get in, and we all have in our organizations, we have the people that will immediately go to the worst part of the challenge. Okay, it's good to know what the bottom is, but you as leader have got to be able to understand there's an upside in here somewhere. I gotta figure it out so I can show my team what it is and get us all working towards the same thing. Learn from everyone how to show up and how not to show up. I've worked for a lot of people, an awful lot of people. At the beginning of my career, most of them demonstrated to me who I did not want to be in the workplace. The guy who fired me because I wanted to take vacation that I had accrued. He paid me for the vacation. I mean, he had to pay me for the vacation, okay? But he just resented the idea that my family was more important than his business. Well, that taught me about showing up. Um, so understanding those opportunities and the people that you engage with, you can learn from every single person that you interact with. Powerful, meaningful lessons that will make you a better leader. And for years, what I was learning is, I don't want to do that. 
I don't want to do that. And what does that mean when I'm then in that leadership opportunity in that leadership position? I have been blessed the last 15, 20 years that most of the people that I've interacted with in terms of the people that I see as leaders are teaching me lessons about how I want to show up. And that's really critically important too because there's a different kind of growth in that experience in terms of understanding. This person has either a skill set that I don't have or a worldview that I think I can get to if I understand a little bit more about what motivates them and, 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 and how they are. Um, one of my employers, Mabel Freeman, I don't know if any of you know Mabel. Mabel was at Ohio State University for 30, 40 years. She was director of the honors program and then became director of undergraduate admissions and first year experience. Mabel could sit at a podium in a room of 2,000 people and make every parent in that room feel like she was talking to them individually. Most incredible public speaker I have ever met. I love to watch Mabel speak. And then usually I had to get up and speak right after her. So know who you are. I'm not Mabel. Don't try to be Mabel. Don't pretend to be Mabel but learn some of what she does in order to make that same kind of connection. And what I learned from Abel is how to use my own personal stories to help people get comfortable with who I am. And so there are a whole bunch of parents that know about my kids, the kid, the boy, and loafer, because those were the stories I would tell about the college experience, and it would make everything okay. Um, so learn from everyone that you interact with. There's always something there. Um, I get a lot of um, political power by being able to say, President Comerford wants this. And John might not know it, but I say it a lot, <laughs> okay? My team knows it. I think I say it more than other people on cabinet. I do. I think I am trying to make sure that when I'm meeting with a group of people, if I believe this is an institutional initiative and that this is in alignment with what my boss wants, I'm going to use that as part of my bringing people to the table. With my team, I want them to know exactly how I would react in that situation so that if I'm not there, they are 97% certain if Jefferson were here, this is what he would do. I am not saying they need to do what I would do. I don't want them to do what I would do unless they think it's appropriate. But I want them to know with real comfort this is how Jefferson would respond to this situation. Because then I know if they're making a different choice, they're doing it consciously, and they're doing it for a reason. My worst management experiences have been when the people who are closest to me and my team are too much like me. They think like I think. They're hyper-rational the way I am. Mark and I work so well together. Mark is not hyper-rational. I don't mean that as a, you know, but we, we can play off of each other in ways that I couldn't play off other people in that role because it's important for me that I am surrounded by people who have a different point of view. There's actually incredible research out there coming out of the University of Michigan that teams that are made up of diverse people are better problem-solving teams than teams that are less diverse and more skilled because it is that convergence of multiple different points of view that are important. And, and so I think it's just critical that you surround yourself with a leadership team, your leadership team, of people who are different than you are, who think different, who grew up differently. It's not as comfortable all the time, but you get to better decisions as a group when you have those different viewpoints. And sometimes, again, you go back to the list of when you're damn confident, when you're a bit of a controller, and when you're hyper-rational, sometimes that's a difficult place for you as a leader to be in 
to give space for that conversation, to let people bring their difference into that meeting, but you'll be at a better place when you do. Believe in yourself, but let them change your mind. Um, I took a self-assessment um, two years ago, maybe. Uh, this was for sales managers. And, and what I do is, in many ways, sales. Um, and I scored really well on this sales assessment, except in one area. I failed in negotiation. I mean, the guy who interpreted it, he said, you got like the lowest score possible in interpretation. I don't understand. And I said, well, because you don't understand. Because I encourage people to change my mind. I already know what I believe. And I believe it really highly. I'm damn confident. I mean, I mean, I do know what I believe. And I want my team to passionately tell me when I am wrong. And that takes training, because people don't like to say to their boss, well, some of them do, but people don't like to say to their boss, hey, I disagree. If you're on cabinet, you know, my intro is, hey, can I ask a question? Whenever I say that, can I ask a question? I am going to disagree with wherever we are. OK, so I try to be polite. OK, I, I start off by, could you tell me why you believe this thing that is obviously not right? OK. <laughs> But you have to have this opportunity for dialogue. And so I work very hard in my team to get people able to say, wait a minute, before we go on, let's come back to this conversation. I tell them, if you don't speak, you just voted yes. Because I'm laying out my argument. So if you are quiet, you assent. And as long as you understand that, we're really, really good. But I want you to change my mind if I am wrong. And so we have these conversations about hiring. We have these conversations about strategic initiatives. We have lots of conversations about text and messages and stuff. And, and, and they're really important. And they get us to a better place. They might tell you otherwise. I don't think I have to win in all those situations. Some of them I do. I know, I do hold the card of being able to say, okay, this is what we're gonna do. But I really do encourage my team to change my mind. Show me a better way to do this and I will let you do it. I wanna be surrounded by people who are way smarter than me, way smarter. I want everyone on my team to be able to step into my role and take my job. And I want them all to work harder than I do. I, I mean, that's how I look good is when my team performs at that level. And, and if they're not performing at that level, I need to get them there. That's my job. So learn and teach your team how to be a jerk. This just goes right back to this conversation about they have to be able to change my mind, to engage with me. On my team, we sit around a table. At that moment, you are no longer representing your area of the organization. So you're not admissions, you're not financial aid, you're not marketing, you're not. You are enrollment management. And you are as responsible for what the person across the table from you does as you are for your own work. And the only way we as an organization are really, truly strong is when we can call each other out. That means people being able to call me out. That means peers being able to call each other out. This is difficult work. It's difficult because people like each other. They want to be friendly, don't want to be the person who's always causing problems. OK, but there are times we have to hold each other to account or we aren't doing our jobs. And so as a leader, I have to teach my team how to do this. My first pass at it, I had four direct reports in um, a meeting room at the Westerville Library. And we started out by going around the table and telling everybody what their best strength was. And that was easy. Everybody got that really good. And then I said, OK, now tell them what their greatest weakness is. OK, lovely woman on our team broke down in tears because she couldn't even say something that she perceived as bad or negative about somebody else. 
okay, well, if you can't do that, if you can't say you always show up to meetings late, how in the world are you going to say this thing that you're doing or your team isn't, we're going to not make our goals? I mean, you won't be able to do that. So you really have to figure out how do you teach people to be a jerk with a small j, which is about being honest and direct in ways that are uncomfortable. Um, and they will tell you, I push them. I push them on that one. So develop a leadership philosophy, make it public. This is the beginning of my leadership philosophy. You might not be able to read that. I believe that work is a vital partnership between the organization and its employees. Every role adds value to the organization. The organization gives value to its employees through compensation, professional development, and growth opportunities. I am sharing this document so that the enrollment management team has a clear line of sight to my values, expectations, and priorities. It not only allows me to clarify my own beliefs about what it means to be a leader, it also provides personal accountability. You are now empowered and encouraged to let me know if I drift away from the values and beliefs that I espouse. This is on the door of my office. Anybody coming in my office can see it and read it. And then it is, there is a list of bulleted expectations. This is what I perceive my responsibility to, is going to be, what my team should expect from me, and what I expect from them. It's very clear and right up front. What are my priorities? What are my, what exasperates me? What's good? They all know. Don't do a visit day if you're not going to do it right, because I will be on you for that. We can't afford it. And then what are my non-negotiables? So if you're not going to be honest, if you're not going to respect other people in our organization, and you're not going to value diversity, go work for somebody else. You don't belong on my team. And I'm very direct. And I made my direct reports come up with their own leadership philosophy and post it. Because we want to be transparent about who we are. Create common language throughout your organization, top to bottom. We want to be able to speak and speak in a common set of experiences so that people know who we are and, and what we're doing. And so being able to make sure that everybody understands the language that you're doing, every organization has its own. One way that we do common language is book club. We read a lot of books. These are some of the books we read in the last three years. These are mostly leadership books, which are not my greatest things in the world, but um, they help us as a team come together. We liked positive intelligence so much, every person, all 40 people in enrollment management ended up with a copy of that book and read it. Now, you saw I spent two years as a teacher. We have a book. I sit down with my direct reports and, and our, our kind of leadership team, and we have book club, and we, I have questions, and we talk about it. And then they get to go to their direct report team and do it over because they learn more in the teaching, I think, than they do necessarily in the first pass through. But this idea, and then you keep doing this cascading it down, you create common language and experience in your organization. Um, find your accelerators. This is really about disruption. So find your accelerators. You're sitting in the point. The point is one of Otterbein's accelerators. This building, changes the way the world perceives Otterbein University. That's what I mean by accelerator. It is the thing that makes people look at us and go, oh, you are so much more than I thought you were. Now, I would love it if I could say we all knew this at Cabinet when we went all in on this, that this was going to be an accelerator. We didn't. We'd started an engineering program. We needed a house for engineering. We owned a big empty warehouse. The original plan was square and offices through and through and no open space, no collaboration. But we ended up getting there and we got it right and it changed who we are to the world. So I spent a lot of time thinking about what are those next set of accelerators? Are they technology driven? Are they, we're doubling down on affordability. We think affordability can be accelerator for us in, 
in private education. We're doubling down on partnerships, especially public-private partnerships. That can set us apart from other universities in very distinctive ways. We're getting into micro badges and, and certificates and non-credit coursework. And so, so we're looking to see what are things that will make us really distinct and different from our competitors. And in that sea of disruption, we really need to be engaged in that. Um, because if we don't, somebody else might find that next big thing. I mean, it's funny to know Central Ohio universities are looking to build suddenly innovation centers because of the experience they've seen with us. Great, let them. Let's get on to something new and, and really uh, enhance and, and develop um, what we are. The hardest thing to do is to learn to manage through other people. So you get promoted because you're a doer, but being a leader is not always about the doing. It's about helping other people understand how to do. And the bigger and more complex your organization is, the less connection you have as a leader to the people that are actually doing the work. And you have to be able to influence that work. It's still gotta be your vision through these people in between. It's really, really hard to learn how to do. It's really hard to teach other people how to do. But it's an incredibly important lesson um, for leadership because you cannot, the day you jump in and do work for other people is the day you're not doing what you're getting paid to do, which is lead the organization. And then finally, my closing point, as a leader, I think my job is to grow the next generation of leaders within my organization, across the landscape. I have former employees in leadership roles in universities across the United States. Um, some of them worked for me as students, some of them as, as professional employees, but I feel like I have been able to help touch and grow people who will continue to change the industries they get into because they've learned something valuable from that experience. And that's what I really think my job is, is to prep these organizations to be here for the next 175 years by training the people who need to understand how to do that. So that's all I got. <laughs> Questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so, so there are a whole lot of people at universities across the United States who still think that things are going to go back to the way they were. This is the way they were. Uh, okay, they're not, there is, yeah, it's, there will be cycles of population, okay, but with all of the disruption that's there, we don't go back to where we were 10 years ago. We don't go back to where we were 20 years ago. Uh, universities, like every in industry, have to evolve. And the people that are waiting for things to get back to normal are going to go out of business. I, I mean, that is really, really true. Um, so will there be some rebound in population? Probably. But that won't solve all of the challenges that we face in higher education as an industry. Debbie? Well, that was the challenge was sitting in, in, in the hospital room with my wife and new daughter reading the Help Wanted ads and not letting her find out what I was doing. That was the real, the real <laughs> challenge. Um, I have, when I join an organization, intentionally or not, and I wish I could say my career path was planned in any way it's never been, but, but I do look around and kind of pay attention to roles and see where I think decisions are being made and, and kind of who has power in this organization, who, who doesn't. And, and so when there are changes that affect that equilibrium, I step forward. And so 
I went to Ohio State, I was working noon to nine with students doing telecounseling. The woman that managed our inbound call center quit. I volunteered. I said, I know call centers, I'll do that work. So I was now responsible for units from 8 a.m. until 9 p.m. And, and everyone thought, oh, we're going to do this for a couple of months while we do a search and stuff. And when I left 17 years later, they were still part of my team. Um, I do empire build. I mean, I mean, I look for opportunity to step up and do more. And they always happen in times of challenge. My, our director left. Great, we need people to step up in leadership roles. I'll do more. It's not about money. It's, it's, it's about the opportunity to grow. And if you demonstrate, you get. I mean, that's just the truth. Do the work, you'll get recognized for it. Other questions? Yes, we have. Philip. Well, I got to go to the gym, and, and there's just too much to do in the morning. I mean, if I could get up at 3.30, I can't do that. 15 minutes makes a huge difference, yeah. But coffee's got to get brewed. I mean, there's just, things have to happen. Anything, any other questions? Well, thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you all.